Hello, and welcome everyone to another Incarnate live stream. My name is Mati, and today we're going to be showing you part one of how to create castles. Now, castles are a rather large endeavor. There's a lot of pre-planning involved, so it's going to be put into multiple parts. There's no way we can fit it all into one stream. In this stream, we're basically going to be covering the first and ground floors probably of the castle and all the, the functions of the castle, as well as over going over the curtain wall, barbican, and other features as well. One of the important things that I want to stress about this stream as well is we're going to talk about function and fantasy because just having a purely functional castle based off of history isn't going to be as, quite as fun as adding a fantasy element to it because that fantasy element is necessary for your D&D experience. Just having a plain old castle without a fantastical element kind of makes for a not a fun battle map. So it's nice to add both fan, uh, function and fantasy and we'll be covering both of those in today's stream. Now, before we jump right into that, let's go ahead and just do a quick couple announcements. If you go to that notification bell in the top right corner, you'll notice see what's new. And we started this whole new thing called weekly map prompts. Our Maptober went so well that I think a lot of people really enjoyed those prompts and it really kind of encouraged them to try different themes and different prompts and kind of improve upon their skill. And instead of doing a one a prompt a day, we're doing a prompt a week. That should give you enough time to work on something fun instead of just one day. Because sometimes you just need a little more time. A week should give you plenty. I'll quickly just go over what those are going to be. The first one's going to be the Well of Souls. Next week, it's going to be the Hellmouth, Dragon's Rest, Cloud Castle, and Frozen Fortress. So I'm very, very, very excited about these map prompts. I think there's going to be fun, and I hope that others will be encouraged to go along with that. The other thing, other quick announcement I want to make is our stream calendar. Last, or this month really, we weren't able to do Realistic Water just because of a dental appointment. So we're going to do Realistic Water on Wednesday the 7th. Super excited about that with the fantasy battle map style. So I'm excited. We're also going to be doing how to create taverns because, hey, every adventure has got to start somewhere. And they, a lot of them happen in taverns, right? Hello there, Brian. Welcome. Glad to have you here. I'm also going to be doing how to create ambushes because you know what? Ambushes are kind of a staple of any campaign, whether it's on a road, you're on a raft, wherever it might be, ambushes are a great element to put into your campaign. And then finally, we're going to be doing water mills, and I'm super excited about that. It's also going to be with the fantasy battle map style. Pretty much all the streams this, this coming month are going to be fantasy battle maps because I know everyone loves those battle maps. All right. Now you know for the announcements, let's go ahead and jump right in. I'm just gonna go ahead and edit this map and open it up. Now, making a castle is, like I mentioned before, there is a lot of pre-planning involved. I definitely recommend that you go ahead and look up castles, look up floor plans that you might like, and things like this. And I'm gonna be working on a small castle, by the way. I'm not gonna make a massive one, but all the things you're gonna be learning in this stream you can apply to a much larger castle. So just because we're making a small castle in this stream doesn't mean that your castles have to be small as well. They can be as big as you want. Just know that the bigger the castle, the more work it is because there's a lot of different rooms in a castle or rooms in a keep of the castle. And there's a lot of different infrastructure buildings and a lot going on. So a castle is a massive endeavor and you want to do as much pre-planning as possible because there's no way you're going to sit down and just out of the blue without any planning going to put just piece together a castle. It's going to require a floor plan, a sketch. Things like that are going to be absolutely necessary. All right, well, let's get started. Let's go ahead and turn this title off right here. Now, there's a couple things that you need to factor in when you're making a castle. One is going to be your resource availability. That means accessibility to water, food, and other important resources like ore, timber, things like that. So you have to pick a location that's going to have access to those resources. Two, we're going to also talk about access to roads or to a river or ocean that allows you to do trade or to travel. So you want to have roads, something close to roads, as well as maybe water for your traveling on a ship or a boat. Lastly, natural defenses. 
natural defenses are absolutely quintessential because natural defenses make it so much easier for you to put that castle there, right? So there are a couple things when you factor in about natural defenses. And let's go ahead and just break down what we have here and the landscape that I've used. Normally when you're making a castle or any kind of structure, you're gonna start with the landscape first. I've pre-made the landscape here and hopefully it will help you when you're pre-making yours. But this whole thing right here is what's called a outcropping. An outcropping is stone that pops out above the ground and it works great as a foundation. You don't have to dig very deep for the foundation. And you can also use the materials. And now this is a limestone outcropping that's on the bank of a river. So it's a good location. It's got water there for travel. It also acts as a defense. This limestone outcropping is right as it reaches the waterfront is about 70 feet high. So it's nice and tall. Ships, cannons can't hit the castle. It's it's going to have a unobstructed view of the surround because it's so high up. So it's a prime location. Height is super important. It works as a great natural defense. Arrows will go further, unobstructed view. So it's really kind of the excellent location for putting down a castle. All right. So now once, now, now that we've got all that kind of figured out the location and what we're doing with it, let's make a quick sketch. Sketch is really, really important because it's going to give you an idea of what you're going to be making. Now, you don't have to use the sketch, have to follow the sketch perfectly because things might change as you go. Just expect that. Change is good. It's okay if you don't follow the original sketch. The sketch is just there so that you're not just eyeballing it. Okay, the sketch is there to help you to give you an idea. Let's go ahead and break down some elements of a castle. Now the castle is everything combined in what you see here. It's not just the keep. The keep is the most recognizable part of a castle, but it's not the whole part of the castle. The castle includes a bunch of components. So the keep is going to be obviously the most recognizable. Okay, that keep is going to be where the royal family lives, where the, where the Great Hall might be, or Grand Hall. It's where your solars and apartments, cabinets, offices, all that stuff is gonna be within the keep. The next thing that's most noticeable about most castles is gonna be the curtain wall. That's gonna be this main wall right here that surrounds the entire thing. Now the internal part of the curtain wall is called the inner bailey or inner ward or just ward. You could also have a inner ward within the castle itself, but I'm keeping the castle without an inner ward. So that inner bailey is going to be the encased part of the castle. Let's go do some components of the castle or of the keep. We're not going to cover all of them, but you're going to notice a couple things. There's a tower in each corner. You'll also notice that there's one of the towers has what's called a donjon. The donjon is going to be the highest point or the tallest tower. And we're going to put like a dovecot in there probably. And a dovecot is basically a place where you put your pigeons. And we'll go over a little bit about dovecots, some of the history and what they're used for and how carrier pigeons are trained to uh, travel and put information. So it's going to be, we're going to be looking forward to that part. Now you're also going to notice some other things that are attached to the curtain wall. You're going to notice what's called a barbican or a gatehouse. The barbican is your first defense. It's attached to the main entrance and it's going to be well fortified. The walls are going to be thick and there's going to be some other interesting things in the barbican like murder holes, a pit. And if you want, you can put in a drawbridge. It just depends on what kind of defenses you're going to be using. So there's that draw, that barbican. There's also going to be what's called a postern gate. A postern gate is basically a small uh, portal or gate that leads down to the waterfront or a small path that could be carved into a mountain. And it's basically a private entrance that's meant for the Lord and Lady. It's not really meant for other visitors to use. It's private. It leads to a private dock and it can be used. Uh, and it's not, and it's also a highly defensible position because it's so small. There's no way on earth that uh, attackers would plan a siege on such a small location. You need large open spaces for troop movement and things like this. So a postern gate is a very is a not a very good place for a siege to take place. That's why it's so small. Most sieges are going to be happening where the barbican or the gatehouse is. Oh, uh, you know what? Hey, Fretonate, 
I first time chatter welcome I used what's called hills just look up hills and there's two different kinds so go check out hills super cool to use okay by the way if any of you have information that I'm not presenting here please let me know there is a ton of different things that I'm not a professional I'm an armchair historian when it comes to castles I'm not a professional I don't have a degree in this so feel free to add any information that you have to the chat because hey this is a learning experience and we're going to learn from each other so feel free to share whatever information you have I'm really grateful that we can share all this information with the community so if I miss something or I don't mention something don't be shy pipe up put that in the chat okay because I love that so please share whatever information you have about castles okay because that's exciting all right the last part that we're going to talk about too here is that you notice that there's some infrastructure so you have kennels which is basically where dogs are held so hunting dogs if the lord wants to go on a hunt the dogs are kept in the kennels there's a blacksmith that blacksmith is basically where you're going to be making the bits and pieces that you need for let's say maybe your armor if maybe they're specialized in armor with armor as well as just pieces for your horse it just depends but a blacksmith or armor smith weapon smith or a jewelry smith all of those things can be in your infrastructure remember this is a small castle a small castle oh, not a super wealthy lord and lady but wealthy enough to afford a castle and to have some infrastructure there's also your mason your mason don't forget is that if important part of the infrastructure for laying down your stonework walls things like that retaining walls that's what your masons for there's also going to be a carpenter for obvious reasons to make all of your woodworks cabinets window sills you name it all those things are going to be involved shutters it's going to be with your carpenter finally you're going to have your stable if the lord wants to go on a hunt or leaves wants to go outside of the castle onto the land they're going to want to go to the stable retrieve their horses or that's maybe where the coach is it just depends so different things okay so that's the sketch let's go over some of the floor plans for the keep because the keep is such an iconic part of a castle let's go ahead real quick I'm gonna remove the labels here and we'll go ahead and touch base on like I said the floor plan now the first floor is gonna be your cellar or what's sometimes called an undercroft let's go ahead and zoom in here so you can see it a little bit better here and I'm going to obviously take this arrow over here. I'm going to click this arrow. I'm going to use it since you cannot see my mouse. So the first thing you're going to notice is this open big space. This is called an undercroft or a cellar. You can kind of label it whatever you want. There are different names for things. But this is just a big open space. And it can be used for a, a different things. We'll also show um, the internal parts of this. This is going to go over the sketch. And the uh pardon me go over the sketch and the floor plan and we'll move on to other things from there first thing we'll go counterclockwise the first thing you'll notice is the crypt your crypt is basically where the lords and ladies or royal families are buried when they die it's basically a place where they go and the crypt is generally located below the chapel so if we go up to that next floor you're probably going to find the chapel right above the crypt with access to the crypt in the chapel that next one you're going to notice is going to be the wine cellar. That's where your wines are going to be stored. And it's a great place to have maybe a battle if you want or make it haunted. Put some fun stuff in there, right? And the next is going to be a larder. If you're not familiar with what a larder is, a larder is basically like a space where you can store food. It's usually generally pretty cold. Now, it's not the same thing as an ice chest or maybe a, a, a cold house. It's not the same thing, but a larder is where you would store things like maybe bread, vegetables, and stuff like that. It's going to be relatively cooler, but not like uh, an ice chest or anything like that. So it's not frozen, but cold enough. The next is going to be called a casemate. Now, a casemate is a strong room or a fortified position that's generally located underneath what's called the rampart. Here, I've got it underneath the gatehouse, but a casemate is a strong room or a fortified room where soldiers can go if the castle's been breached. They can go in there and hide out. It's basically a place for you to go as a last resort. You've lost the battle. They've stormed into the keep. They've made it into the castle, got past the Barbican, and made it into the keep. That casemate is where soldiers can go to lock themselves in. 
to protect themselves from being killed. So that's what's called your casemate. Next is going to be called your dungeon. And there, you'll notice that there are several rooms in the dungeon. There's a room here, a room here, and a room here. Maybe you might have a larger dungeon room for maybe putting royalty or a VIP um, prisoner. It just depends. Or if you want to put two people into a room, you could use that room right there. Also, just notice that I put a person right here. That dot right there is a person to give you scale, just so you know just how big this castle is. It's not very large. Remember, small castle, less work. Big castle, more work. Or should I say small castle, lots of work. Big castle, a lot more work. So remember, there is no just putting down a castle right away. So this is the layout for the Undercroft, or you could call it a cellar, basement, whatever you want. That's up to you. Let's go ahead and go back into the sketch, and we'll go ahead and talk about the next floor. Let me turn that cellar off. Explain that next floor. It's going to be, the next floor is going to be your first floor, or ground floor, really. And you know, the ground floor... We're going to go ahead and start at the top before. We'll start with the chapel. Remember the chapel was located, the crypt was located right below the, the chapel where there's the chapel and the crypt is going to be right below that. To the left, you're going to notice the pantry, the kitchen, and the buttery. And the pantry is basically a place where you store dry foods. Okay, that's it. It's just a place where you store food and it's attached to the kitchen, right? So that way it's easily accessible. The buttery, if you're not familiar with what a buttery is, a buttery is where you make beer because wine is generally reserved for royalty. The royal family drinks wine, while beer is provided to soldiers, maybe visitors that aren't of royal stock, quote unquote. But a buttery is where your beer is going to be. So that's going to be your beer. Mmm, buttery, delicious. There's also going to be your gatehouse. This is a second gatehouse that's inside, that's attached to the keep, and it's another point of defense, a fortification. So if attackers do get past the Barbican, they'll also have to contend with the gatehouse. So the gatehouse is super, super cool. And we're going to be going over the floor plan for everything inside of the gatehouse. So I'm excited about that. Next comes the place of arms. A place of arms is a place where soldiers can come together and prepare for mobilization to wherever they need to go in the keep. So if soldiers need to mobilize in that little or in that spot called the place of arms and they can move and go to the gatehouse. So it's basically just a place of arms is basically where soldiers can be mobilized and put together and be moved to wherever they need to go into the castle. Last is called a garter robe. And I'll be showing you some cool diagrams about garter robes, but it basically it's a lavatory or a bathroom. And we'll be going over all of that. So I'm excited for that. Next, and fine, and of course, the most iconic part of the first floor, or generally in within a keep, is called the Great Hall. Your Great Hall, or Feast Hall, is where your feasts are going to take place. It's where lords and ladies might entertain guests. It's where the main table is. And if it's not, if you don't want to have a Great Hall, it's okay. You can also throw in a throne room, or whatever you want. There's a lot of different things that you can put into that center part. But for this, we're going to say it's a Great Hall. All right, so that's our first floor. Let's go ahead and touch base on our second floor. All right, our second floor is going to be called the Solar Suites. Okay, a solar is a room. It's a private room for the lord or lady or royal family members for them to stay, right? So it's called the Solar Suites. Those individual rooms are called solars. So Solar Suites is the whole floor. Let's go ahead and start at the top. Above the chapel on that first, second floor is called an oratory. An oratory is a private chapel for just the lord and lady. Servants would not be using the chapel, would not, would not be using the oratory. They would only be using the chapel. That's it. Next, you're going to see the queen's room. That queen's room is, well, you guessed it, where the queen sleeps. And she also has a boudoir, which is attached to her room. If you're not sure what a boudoir is, it's basically a powder room. Next is going to be cabinets. Now, in English, in England, cabinets are, are referred to as offices. And these cabinets are private rooms where the royal family or king can discuss things with 
either your maester, advisors, guests. It's just a private place, an office where you can talk with people without being overheard. So a cabinet is an office. Next comes the king's room. Okay, and the king's room is just where the king king sleeps. It's his own private solar. And then there's also a garter robe. Now, one of the reasons why most of these castles have these smaller rooms is because castles are large and drafty, and it's hard to heat up large rooms within a castle. So kings and queens and royal family will generally retire to their smaller rooms in the wintertime because those smaller rooms are so much easier to heat up. So smaller rooms are smaller. It's easier to heat them up. And so they're retired to the wind into those rooms whenever they need to get warm. So there's no reason to go stay down into the great hall when there's not a feast going on because it's just too dang cold. Castles are drafty. Air, heat escapes very easily. So you need to have small rooms that are easily to heat up. Now the center part of the solar suites could be a number of things. You could put a library there. You could put fantastical elements there. You could put maybe an, an armory, uh, maybe a museum, maybe a place where all the arm where the where the uh, coats of arms would be. It could be a lot of different things. It could be a large study. So whatever that center part, that's up to you to decide what you want them to be. Okay, let's go ahead and jump onto that third floor real quick. This third floor is going to be the top floor and there's obviously a roof as well where soldiers can be stationed but there's going to be a couple things maybe some apartments can be here some cabinets some extra garter robes and of course our dovecot which is really going to be even higher than the third floor i just grouped them together dovecot's going to probably going to be four or five floors really above that third floor and remember that dovecot is where your carrier pigeons are going to be all right so those are going to be your floors and we'll go ahead and move on to that next step. Let's go ahead and turn all this stuff off and let's discuss where a castle, where the process of the castle really begins. So let me go ahead and turn off the sketch. Now, first thing generally is, is that temporary housing is going to be constructed when the castle is in its beginning construction. This temporary housing is what is where the Lord and Lady might be sleeping, where laborers might be staying, where your engineer, your masons, architect, engineer, this is where those people are going to be staying. So you got to have temporary housing for those people to stay before the castle starts getting construction get constructed. You're also going to have a temporary wall as well. You need a temporary wall because you don't want to be attacked while you're doing your construction, right? Notice also that in that these temporary walls, see that brown that's located underneath? That is going to be a ditch. You want to create, dig these nice deep ditches right in front of these temporary walls because it's going to make it harder for people to try to scale those temporary walls if there's a big old deep ditch right there. You could even put a ditch on the other side if you want it as well. And it also works as a kind of a foundation for that temporary wall. Let's go ahead and remove the temporary. I'm going to turn these things off for now. I don't want them to get in the way of the next step. So let's go ahead and turn off temporary wall and housing. Let's go jump right into the keep and the keeps infrastructure and everything or the structure. Let's go over that first floor or really the um, I think it's called the undercroft. So let's go over that. Let me go ahead and find the keep. Let's go with the undercroft. Okay, let's go ahead and jump right in. Now I'm using black. I used just now the way that I made this. If you're curious how I made these walls, all I did was just take walls and some other stamps and just made the, to drop the, the brightness all the way to zero so it's black. The reason why I've done it this way is because this kind of makes all the rooms pop out because black is a neutral color. Everything just pops out against that black. So it works really, really well, really, really well to use black. And because you can't really see the top of a wall, so I've used black to represent the negative space that is the walls. Let's go in real quick and just take a look at everything here. And what we've got, remember I mentioned, let's start at the top. I mentioned the crypt, right? Here is that crypt. The crypt is accessed through the chapel on the back part, in the back of the chapel behind the altar, which is generally referred to as the sacristy, 
Okay, so you go through the sacristy and you go down these stairs to go into the crypt. This is where your dead relatives are basically going to be living if you're royalty. Okay, they're going to be stored probably into the, whether it is going to be sarcophagus or whether they're going to be put into little slots. It just depends on where you want to place your dead. Okay, so that again, that's going to be that crypt. The next part is going to be that wine cellar. Remember we talked about the wine cellar? This is where that wine is stored. Remember, only royals are drink the wine. It's a staple for royal tea, unlike servants and maybe, maybe even knights who might just drink beer. That next one is going to be what's called that larder. Remember what a larder was? It's where that nice, cool space where you're going to store some foods, right? And there's even a storage room at the top right here. Now, if you're wondering how I constructed these walls, the real trick is to use the grid. You turn on your grid and start putting things together. All right. The grid is going to be your ally. Now, we don't have a snap to grid option yet, but it's highly popular. So look forward to that. And we also have a room tool in the works. So putting together a castle will be so much easier once the room tool is implemented. Believe me, I'm super, super excited about a room tool. Making stuff like this will just be so much easier easier okay let's just keep on going remember the last one we mentioned the casemate this is that casemate right here you'll notice that there are some some doors right here some fortified doors right here and it, it, the casemate is set into two rooms here's that first room of the casemate and so if people should by some chance be able to get in excuse me you'll have a second room right over here that you can lock up and to go into if they should be able to penetrate that, that first room. So having multiple rooms makes it even more fortified and safer for your royal family. Remember, we also mentioned dungeon as well. Remember, we have these cells right here. And you'll notice we have two small cells and a, a second kind of larger or a third larger cell that's got two beds in it, right? So it's nice to have a little bit more extra room. And when it comes to when it comes to the center part, this is where we're going to start talking about fantasy. We're going to start talking about fantasy and function. Now, I did mention that we're doing these um, weekly map prompts, and so I went ahead and in the center of the the undercroft, I put the Well of Souls, which is our first. Lo and behold, our first map, map prompt for December. So I've created this nice little centerpiece. You know, when you're going down into a cellar of some place, you know, it's nice to have something going on. Like, where's the action, right? All the rooms just having a function, but not having some fantastical element to it really makes your castle or your structure kind of boring. So I've added in a well of souls which is kind of that centerpiece and that undercroft so that your players have something to interact with, right? So they can run around and try to defend themselves against things that might be coming out of the well or they want to interact with the well. Maybe there's zombies coming out of the well, souls, whatever you want, right? So having a little centerpiece that's a little bit more fantasy oriented instead of function will give something a little extra spice for your players. Now I've also made it a second centerpiece that goes in the undercroft and that's going to be your holy site. So if you don't want to have that well of souls, I want to put this holy site. And the holy site is basically maybe there is a statue that maybe holds a fantastic power. And there's some candles going around this underground, maybe this pool or aquifer or anything like that. Oh, yeah. And absolutely, Buzzy Yuga. Absolutely. You can totally put a throne room in the Great Hall. Usually they're put together. So it's up to you, totally up to you how you want to go about it, go about doing it. Okay. So having either one of those things, having something a little more fantastic in your cellar kind of gives a little bit more spice for your cellar. So I absolutely recommend that you do something in there to get it going. All right. Hey, first time chatter. Glad that you're here. Absolutely glad to find you here. Welcome. So that's going to be your undercroft, your cellar. And remember, just add in that fantasy element because it's just going to make it so much nicer. I'm just go ahead and let's just go and turn off the undercroft floor as we don't need it anymore. And let's go ahead and move on to the next floor, which is our first floor. 
And that's the last floor in the keep that we'll cover today. And we'll go ahead and move on to other things because we still have so much to cover. Hey, first time chatter. Hey, two of them. Awesome. Those candles are just stamps. They're not hard to find. Just type in candles in Fantasy Battle Maps and you'll find a whole bunch. If you can't seem to find them, just when you go into the catalog, just make sure that you go ahead and click um, Fantasy Battle Maps. And when you go ahead and click this right here that says Expand All Stamp Sets. So that way, if they're hidden, if those candles are hidden away in a stamp set, you'll be able to expand all those stamp sets and you'll be able to find that can the stamp that you're looking for a little bit easier. So just kind of a pro tip there. Okay, let's talk about this first first floor. Okay, now we mentioned that the chapel is above the crypt. So I want you to we're gonna go ahead and zoom in. And you're gonna check out the chapel here. There are a couple elements you're gonna notice in there. The, the chapel is kind of set up into three different rooms. This first room right here is where your servants are gonna be. They don't sit with the royalty. They sit in a separate part. They sit in the back, which is generally called the lower part. All right. That's where your servants live or your servant not live, but where your servants sit. The next one is going to be what's called your nave or upper part of your chapel. That's where your lords and ladies and the royal family sits during church services. And remember, the chapel is very close or generally attached to this great hall section right here. So it's important to make sure it's close. So right after you've had your feast, with your uh, family and, and guests, you can go and do your church services. Now, it doesn't have to be a Christian or whatever, whatever religion you come up with when you decorate the chapel. Make sure you put in elements that describe the deity that you're doing. So make sure you throw in some statues, some ornate stuff that gives that chapel some nice decoration to it. So always nice. But yes, it is a tiny chapel. It's not huge. And most rooms in a castle are generally pretty small. And remember, I am making a very small, very small castle. Otherwise, I'd be doing three weeks of prep to make a large castle. Now, you're also going to notice that there are some windows here. Windows are important because natural lighting. That wind, that light is going to come through those windows and kind of light up the chapel. This last part of the chapel is what's called the sacristy. And the sacristy is basically where your priest or your head priest or whatever it is you have there, maybe it's um, a priestess, whatever it is, the person that's in charge of religious services, that's just that private room for them. And it also leads down to the crypt. See, there's a staircase that goes into it and there's a staircase that goes down into the crypt. And of course, there's a staircase that leads into the stairwell that goes up into the tower. Okay. All right. Now that you have the chapel down, let's go ahead and move on to the next place. The next one is going to be where your kitchen area is. Remember, this is your pantry. Okay. Your pantry is where you put your dry foods or you just want to store foods temporarily until a feast begins or dinner time. Totally up to you, right? The next room is going to be your kitchen. Okay. Your kitchen is, of course, attached to your great hall because you want to be able to make the food and just move them right into, right into the, the great hall where you're going to put your food or serve your, serve your masters or whatever. So it's nice to have the kitchen attached and notice that it has the amenities that are needed. You've got cabinetry here for your silverware or dishware. You've got an oven or basically a fireplace here for cooking. You've got your wood and your axe for chopping wood to put into the fire. There's a window for natural lighting. If the fire is not enough lighting, you're also going to see a dishwashing station. And so all the kind of necessary components that you would see in a kitchen, right? Last in that area is your buttery. Remember what a buttery is? It's where you get your butts. I mean, it's where you get your beer, okay? Because remember, wine is only for royals. But you know what? That's just history. You can do whatever you freaking want. Okay. You don't have to follow perfectly. You don't have to, you don't have to do it perfectly historical. I would totally recommend that you totally lay out, uh, totally lay out, uh, in any way that you want. This is just a small castle with a simple layout with function and with both fantasy. Okay. The next part is going to be your gatehouse right here, okay? Your gatehouse is made up of several components. This is going to be the main section where people walk to get in, and you're going to notice some things in the gatehouse. You've got your gates right here, two gates. 
Because what's nice to do is if people try to get into the gatehouse, you can trap them inside of it. And that's what this gate right here is for and this gate right here. You're gonna trap people in. Now, what can often happen is that you can also put a pit there if you want with trap doors so that invaders will fall in. You're also gonna notice that there are some bars right here. And if they're trapped inside, inside of this area, you can go in and shoot arrows or take spears and just stab your attackers to death through those bars because they're trapped. They have nowhere to go. They're gonna get hit. So trapping your enemies, this is what's generally referred to as like a murder room, basically. And it's where you can basically kill <laughs> your, your a trap and it kill your attackers. Generally, there's also something called murder holes. And they're basically holes on the floor above where you can drop projectiles, maybe uh, boiling, scolding water. You can throw in uh, fire, ball, heavy material, whatever it is you need. Those are generally referred to as murder holes that people throw things down. The defenders can throw down on there. These also, these separate rooms right here can also be used as maybe armories, stationing for troops. It's up to you what you want to put in there, as well as access to the towers that lead up to the next floor. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and touch base on the next one. Remember, this one right here was called a place of arms. This is basically where your troops are going to be placed to do mobilize to where they want to go all over, either within the keep or they want to go out into the inner bailey. So that's basically the place at arms. And there's also a staircase that leads down to where the uh, leads down into the undercroft where the prison is. You're also gonna see here are garter robes. Now let's just talk a little bit about garter robes because garter robes are really interesting. I know that I also meant see that you'll see there's some staircases right here. It's because I want the garter robes to be higher up and I'll actually show you why that is. Let's go ahead and talk about that. Let's go ahead and open up this garter robe diagram so that you have an idea of what we're, we're working with here. Let me remove that um that arrow real quick it's kind of going to be in the way so let's move that we'll go back into the keep go into the first floor and i'm going to open up this diagram so that you have a general idea of how a garter robe works let's just go through over this guard this diagram this whole thing this this room right here is what's called the garter robe okay you're going to have some windows which is going to allow for natural lighting because no one wants to take a poop in the dark that's just weird Okay, there's a little, little bit of light so you know what you're doing, all right? You don't wanna miss. This is gonna be the seat. This is where you're gonna sit, and then you're gonna take a poo, and it's gonna go down in what's called a cesspit. And these cesspits are, of course, <laughs> going to be cleaned out by servants because, hey, you don't want that smell lingering for too long. Otherwise, your garter robe is gonna smell like something else. You don't want the garter robe to be like your cesspit. That's not cool. So that cesspit's generally gonna be cleaned out by servants we're going to clean that out all right so now you know a little bit about garter robes you see there's a little bit of distance between the garter robe and the bottom of the cis pit so that that way gravity can do its work and it's going to stay far enough down to where the smell isn't lingering too much up into the garter robe area if it does start to stink hey call that servant and pick up that poo all right okay now let's talk about the main hall okay and there's a couple things that you could put into this main hall right here a lot of different things you could make it a great hall like i mentioned before which is totally doable you can go ahead and throw in maybe a table this is where maybe you do your feasting with your with your royal family and guests you also notice that there is a fireplace right here of course because that fireplace is what's going to be heating up the the great hall so super important to kind of have that. Oopsie, let's go ahead and just lock that up. And I wonder what, oh, there we go. The path is set to zero. There we go. Now you can kind of see it. So there's your fireplace, a dual fireplace that's kind of used both for cooking in the kitchen and the other side for, to keep things warm. And generally those feasting generally takes place in the spring and summertime where it's easier to keep the hall warm. Remember, smaller rooms, easier to heat up. Larger rooms, not so much. Now, if you don't want to have, maybe your lord and lady are estranged and they don't want to do feasting, right? This is a plot element. Maybe they don't want to do that. Maybe they're estranged from their people. They don't like talking to people. They want to be alone. They've maybe been, I don't know, maybe um, 
maybe uh, they're under a spell and they just don't want anyone to be there. So instead, they don't have a, a feasting hall. Maybe they have a throne room instead. Maybe the throne room, and it's and there's no place for feasting, right? You have a throne room in here, and you've got <clears throat> your dais, which is a platform in which like something sits on on top of, for instance, a throne. And so maybe your lord and your lord of this castle is estranged. They've been. <sighs> I don't know, possessed by some creature. And so there's no reason for them to have a feast hall. They're trying to hide their, trying to hide from most of the people while working in the shadows, right? But let's say that you're, you have an audience with them. You want to have some kind of a, uh, a throne room for your lord and lady to sit. Notice that there are some chairs next to that runner that goes up to the dais and the throne. And there's a lot of different things that you can put in that. It doesn't have to be a throne room or a great hall. You could put whatever you want in there. Maybe there's a pool. Maybe there's a garden in there. Whatever it is you want. You can just kind of choose for yourself where you want to put, uh, what you want to put into that main part. The easy ones are, of course, throne room and your great hall. But hey, totally up to you how you want to go about it. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next parts we're going to touch base in the next stream or not next stream but part two this third the second and third floors which is where a lot of the apartments and cabinets are and the dovecot so we'll cover that in another stream so i'm going to go ahead and just turn this off this first floor and we'll go ahead and touch base a little bit about barbicans and the curtain wall and we only have about 19 minutes left so Let's just go ahead and get this started. So let's talk first about what's called a barbican. Let's start with the foundation of the barbican first. Okay. Now at the bottom of the foundation of the barbican is a pit because there's going to be a trap door on the ground floor that's going to be triggered whenever by some kind of mechanism that soldiers can use, whether it's a lever, a lever, or whatever it might be that's going to open up that trap door. So once the attackers are trapped within that room, you can release the mechanism and the attackers are going to fall into that pit. You can put spikes down there. You can put maybe some eldritch tentacles down there. Maybe there's some water down there that's got some sharks. Hey, look, it, even sharks deserve a warm meal. So, hey, might as well give them to them live, right? So, be creative. That's the fantasy element. It's not just a pit where they just fall and maybe break a leg and they die down there slowly. Maybe you want to put something fun down there. So if they die in a more creative way, okay, just saying. Let's go ahead and turn off that foundation and kind of move on to the ground floor. Now in that ground floor, like we said, in that center part is where that trap door is, right? That trap door is going to be pretty much activated by some kind of mechanism. Oh yeah, don't accidentally, <laughs> you're hanging out with your friends, soldiers are drunk and they accidentally pull the lever when captain falls down. Oh shoot, oopsie, sorry captain. <laughs> uh, break a leg, right? <laughs> so you got your trap door, okay? That's the place where they're gonna fall down. You're obviously gonna have your gates. And there are two gates, one at the top and the bottom. And there's also gonna be your stairwells leading up to the roof of leading up to the roof, okay? Or the first floor, really, not the roof, but the first floor. Let's go ahead and touch base on that first floor and what you'd find up there in that first floor. On that first floor, as you go up the stairwells, up to that first floor, you're gonna see what's called murder holes. Remember we talked about this? These are holes for for your defenders to throw down some things that are going to you know, attack. So you, you let's say that you have some uh, boiling, a pot of boiling oil or scalding water that you can throw down the hole. Maybe there's some powder in here that makes your attackers itchy or causes burning. or And then also storage as well, which can be where you put maybe cannonballs, ammunition, equipment, weapons, things like that, or just a staging area for soldiers to go. It's really up to you what you want to put on that first on that first floor. That last floor is going to be your roof, of course. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn off that first floor, and we'll go ahead and turn the roof on for now. 
And let's go over the wall because we're just running out of time now. So we got to quickly go over this. So here's the roof right here. And let's go ahead and throw down our curtain wall because we are running out of time. We got to get going. Okay. Now you may notice at the top here that I'm kind of missing a wall segment. That's because the keep's going to be there. So don't worry. I didn't forget about it. Okay. So this is what's called your outer curtain or your curtain wall, right? And your curtain wall has a lot of different segments part of it. It's going to need access to that's what these wooden platforms are for. These wooden platforms. Oops, I didn't mean to accidentally do that. My mistake. We'll go ahead and undo that. Let's open up that curtain again. My mistake. My bad. There we go. Okay. So first thing, notice you're going to have some access from the ground floor to get up to the walls. That's important. And let's talk about how exactly these walls are kind of put together, right? Because some, like, how is it that medieval engineers put these walls together? I think it's kind of fun to learn about this stuff. So let's talk a little bit about how that works. Let's go ahead and open up a wall segment. Let's open up our walls right here. And you're going to notice right here that the way that the walls are constructed is two horizontal walls are placed and then filled in. Let me just remove a section here. You can kind of see what's inside of it here. Let me remove what's called wall walk. If I remove the wall walk, you'll notice that it's filled in with rock or what's called rubble, which is generally a mix of like mortar and stone, maybe added with lime. I'll show you another diagram so you have a better view of it. Top down is not really the best view. So let's go over that diagram so you kind of have an idea of how exactly that works. Let's go ahead and go back. Let's open up this wall diagram here so you have a general idea of how it works. I'm going to show you a section of a wall and we're going to go over what it is, right? So let's go ahead and zoom out so we can get a better look. I want to be able to see all the labels and see what everything is. So first, let's go ahead and just touch base here and make sure that all my things are on here. So <clears throat> first thing you're going to notice is a wall is made up of what are called courses, okay? Once you've reached a couple feet after constructing the wall and then filling it in with rubble, which is a mix of stone and mortar, you'll go ahead and you'll, once these part right here, let me show you, these parts right here are constructed. Once they're about two or three feet, three or four feet, you go ahead and fill it with that rubble. And then you make the next course. So this section right here is called a course, right? And then you build another course on top of that course until you get to what's called wall walk. This is what's called wall walk right here. It's where your defenders can walk along the wall to throw projectiles at would-be attackers, right? Let's keep going here. Now, one thing you'll notice about the wall is there's something that's called a batter. That's that slope that you see right here. A batter is extremely useful. It has a dual purpose. It acts as a additional foundation for the for the wall, but it also works as something that projectiles can bounce off to hit attackers. So if an attacker threw a projectile, it would bounce off that surface and hit their attackers. So that pitched section of the wall called a batter is a great way to drop projectiles, bounce off, and then hit the people who are trying to attack you. That's generally what batters are used for. So very helpful, right? Let's go ahead and take a look about Let's take a look at what's called a battlement. This whole section right here is what's referred to as a battlement. A battlement is the wall that's facing the outer part, that means facing towards the attackers, and it's made up of multiple components, right? First, you're going to notice these segments, this negative space right here of these segments is referred to as crenellations or embrasures, okay? The part that protrudes out from the battlement is referred to as merlons. And merlons are generally fitted with what's called arrow loops. These arrow loops are what attackers can shoot arrows through and also be protected from your attacker's arrows and projectiles. So it's important to have arrow loops. Okay? And remember, don't forget about our wall walk right here. The wall walk is where players, is where, not players, but where your uh, defenders are going to be walking to get from one part of the wall to the other, okay? All right, because we only have one more thing left to go over and that will end the stream. Let me go ahead and turn off the
a wall diagram. Let's just talk a little bit about infrastructure. Let's go ahead and turn on the keep uh, roof so you can see it for now. We'll go over roof and the other floors in the next, uh, in part two. Let's talk about infrastructure real quick. A couple things that you're going to find in infrastructure. Remember that thing we put in before? So a couple things here that you're going to notice. And, you know, the infrastructure is super important because, hey, you don't want all your infrastructure to be outside of the curtain wall, right? If you're in a siege, you still want to have the infrastructure necessary to continue on, right? If all of your necessary infrastructure is based outside of the castle area, then you'll have to get out of the castle to get the necessary goods and services that you need to live on in daily, the diurnal practices of life, right? So you have a carpenter, of course. Carpenters are necessary for all the wooden parts of the castle or the keep, making cabinets, making shutters, scaffolding, uh, temporary scaffolding for sieges. Sometimes there's not enough stone material uh, to make every part of the castle. And so often temporary parts of the castle made out of wood, stairwells, little bridges that go from one side to a wall or another are going to be used because it's more accessible than stone. Because stone is expensive, it's hard to carry around, wood is not, okay? So a lot of temporary structures would be built in a castle, whether it's a, uh, uh, a bratis, whether it's a oriole, Anything like that can be made of wood, okay? So that carpenter is absolutely necessary. You got your smithy, of course, because hey, if your lord wants those horseshoes, they want the bits and pieces for the horses, they're gonna need a smithy, right? They're gonna need a mason for their, for their stonework, and they're gonna need a barracks, right? And notice that the barracks is relatively located close to the gatehouse so that soldiers can elite immediately exit and go to the defensive positions that they need to go to. So if they need to man the wall, they can go there. If they need to go protect part of the wall over there, they can go there. They can go here. They can run over to here and access into the wall, right? And Or they want to access the wall here, right? So putting the barracks in a central area so that soldiers can easily be mobilized and be moved to each section of a wall that might need to be defended. All right, the last infrastructure pieces are going to be your kennels, which remember, we discussed your kennels is where your lord keeps his hunting dogs, right? And of course, finally, your stables. Now remember, you don't you can add as much infrastructure as you want. If your inner bailey or war, if your bar if your ward or bailey is large enough, you can put as much infrastructure as you want. It's up to you. There are so many different types of infrastructure, but just know that the more infrastructure buildings you want, the more space you're going to need, okay? This is just a small castle, so it's not a very large one. So just the basics are needed for this castle. Remember, you can take all the things that you learned on making a small castle and just apply it to a larger scale castle. My recommendation to you is to use, um, you can use floor plans from real castles and then just kind of build over them in an incarnate and then you can change the rooms to whatever you need to be. Okay, that's up to you. All right. Well, hey, that is it for part one of how to create castles. In the next part, we're going to be covering the second floor, the third floor, the dovecot. We're going to be covering um, more defenses. We're going to be covering the postern gate and a couple other things as well. Maybe even talking about maybe putting in more defenses, maybe digging in a moat if necessary. We can always rescale. We can always rescale uh, this map or resize the map with the resize feature to make it larger if you want to add more stuff to it. So there's still a lot more to come. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm looking forward to part two and when that comes up. So hey, thank you so much. Just some real quick things I want to end a note on. Don't forget about our weekly map prompts and also don't forget to join our discord server because hey our discord server is where we're going to find our mentors feedback channel uh, it's a really really useful resource to be to join our discord server a lot of people are going to be able to help you out if you're needing help so definitely check out uh, our discord server just remember that you need to click that roles 
go to the roles channel first and click the incarnator role because you're not going to be able to see all the channels in the server if you don't click that in that incarnator role. So that's super important. Okay. All right. Well, hey, that concludes the stream next week. On the 7th, we're going to be doing Realistic Water. I'm super stoked. We're probably going to be covering ocean and river. We're going to be covering both. So I'm excited to cover rivers and realistic rivers, realistic water for ocean or beachfront. I'm excited for that. So hey, thank you all again for being here. I will see you all next week. Please stay safe and healthy. And of course, merry map making. I will see you all very soon. Avita Zane.